All right, we're at the top of the hour, so we'll, uh, we'll get this webinar started. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. This webinar is also recorded, so we will make this available uh, as soon as we can. Uh, so, uh, Corey Lawson from the Wildlife Conservation Society Canada uh, has offered to uh, do this webinar on uh, to put bed houses into context. Um, so, um, I won't uh, use any more words on that because Corey will, uh, will have all the information here. If there's time for questions, we'll uh, open it up for questions at the end, uh, but we'll, we'll get back on that. So, when you're ready, Corey, uh, take it away. Thank you very much. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Jordi, for hosting us. And um, the talk today I'm going to give is, is really for people who are trying to make informed decisions about bat boxes. And that could be a wide variety of people at this point. Um, more and more mitigation for habitat loss is certainly um, being requested of many people. Um, and so this is, a, this is actually quite an unusual talk for me to give. Uh, I'll be right uh, right up front with you that um, I don't have a lot of data to present to you. In fact, mostly what I'm hoping to, to do today is really leave you with a bunch of um, food for thought. And that's because we probably need to revisit this idea of bat boxes and artificial structures for bats in general. And to do that, I think we need to take a step back and review some of the things that go into um, decisions from a bat's perspective about where to roost and then decisions that go from, from a manager's perspective about what roost um, can and should be provided for bats. So I'm hoping to sort of give a big overview, kind of step back a little bit, talk about everything in context of bat biology, going back even to thermoregulation and really understanding what it is or we should be doing for bats and then of course in the context of white nose syndrome as well given the fact that we might be looking at trying to recover these populations in many areas. Now the um, this all come uh, kind of to uh, a point for me when I started receiving um, a bunch of, kind of emails a little bit panicked about um, uh, panicked about some of the events that were happening in British Columbia in particular in the summer during our heat wave. So we ended up finding uh, more and more people uh, reporting to us what we're calling um, overheating events. Okay, and, and that's something like bats bulging out of um, a bat box, uh, like you can see in the top here, or bats actually falling out of bat boxes dead during um, what could be considered these more frequent heat waves that we've been experiencing in British Columbia. Um, and it's more than that, though, because we have also been seeing that this is coming out of other places, like some anecdotal reports um, and, and found in some of the gray literature about um, reports of dying bats in bat boxes in kind of larger numbers in California, too, and then coming out of the published literature. Very little is in there yet, but this is um, one example coming out of Spain. Could our bat boxes be death traps um, and overheating then could be an issue? And here's just another um, publication on that as well. And so we had a meeting with the BC Bat Action Team um, last year, kind of an emergency, do we have a problem type meeting. And we're certainly uh, starting to uh, try to better document the situation uh, under which bats do seem to be dying of, of heat exhaustion, is that truly heat stress, uh, trying to piece this together. But of course, it's also very interesting that we also um, have seen this climate change report that comes out for Canada saying, you know, we are getting um, a higher level or higher rate of climate change. And, you know, is it possible that our bats are just falling victim to this? And, it's all too early to really say, I would say conclusively. I mean, I think this is just, this talk is really about getting us thinking and, and trying to figure out what questions we have to ask and what answers we need urgently. So let's just talk about bat boxes um, as a concept in general. We definitely do have this you know, growing concern about overheating and in general, we're starting to look at our bat boxes and say, are, are they good or bad for bats? And 
for the most part, we're finding an extreme lack of information. You know, our bat box studies haven't really been asking this an important question about how well bats are doing in these bat boxes. Um, and, and, and I would like to talk about, you know, box versus house, because I am saying box quite a bit. Um, are we building something that is a house for bats? Or, or is it actually a box? Now, I used to say bat houses all the time, and I think it's quite common, especially in North America, for us to call them bat houses. But I would just kind of, uh, we'll return to this at the end, but I would just ask you to think about the language that we use, and is it descriptive of what we're actually um, doing? Now, there's a lot of literature out there, actually, when you start Googling bat boxes, and if you see some of the reviews, even, even most recently, a report this week um, that came out reviewing um, a lot of the, the things that have been found about bat boxes. And what you'll start to discover is that there's a lot of information there about occupancy, what type of stain, how to place it, what design, what orientation. And they're all sort of largely focused on do they get occupied? What do bats like? And instead of asking the question, how are our bats staring in these boxes? And a lot of the literature and the report, they actually do acknowledge that this is important and they say it should be done, but it's amazing that it hasn't really been done. And this is, you know, this is where we are right now, I think, is trying to scramble to answer this question um, and hopefully uh, soon so that we can provide better guidance. So just kind of the overarching question that we ask is why, why are we building summer bat reef habitat? Why these artificial structures to begin with? Obviously, the main one that most of us face is landowners wanting to evict them from buildings. But we also have logging, you know, uh, other forestry practices, and of course, urban development. Urban development is kind of a double-edged sword with natural habitats being um, taken out and human structures being built. Those human structures nowadays are pretty much good sealed buildings that are not going to offer um, places for bats to roost. So ultimately, we're trying to replace lost habitat. But then, of course, there's also recovery from post white nose syndrome. So, especially in the East right now, what is it that we can or should be doing to help recover populations? And of course, the West may eventually be facing that as well. And then there's the question of habitat enhancement. Should these be used to just enhance rather than replace a roof? And ultimately, the goal we typically have in mind there is to maximize the reproductive success. So how do we meet these goals? Um, ultimately, knowing a few things about bat biology is, is really critical. And um, I think we are definitely seeing more and more people um, being tasked with making decisions about mitigating for lost habitat, trying to maximize and reproductive success in cases of, of recovery plans and so on, right? So mm, having that kind of firm understanding of what it is about that biology, their use of thermoregulation, their energetics, is actually really key to making um, those types of decisions. So, there's a lot we could talk about, obviously, in artificial structures, but we are going to focus here on bat boxes as generally replacing roofs like um, building roofs, attic roofs, for example. So we could ask the question, uh, how do you replace an attic roof? So what type of guidance should be given in order to do that? And that's the kind of question I just I want you to keep in mind. We're going to come back to it. But before we do, Let's just dive back into a little bit of understanding what it is that's so important about roofs to begin with. Think about the Goldilocks of bat roofs. You know, too cold, too hot, just right. And if only it were so simple to be able to point to a box and say that one's just right and that one's too cold or that one's too hot because it's going to change throughout the season. And the needs of the bats change throughout the season as well. So a lot of people do say, oh, I've heard, you know, bats like it hot. And so my bat box should be put in a sunny spot. And a lot of people do that. And then now we're hearing, oh, but now I've heard a rumor that they're too hot and bats can die. So maybe I should just take the bat box down or maybe I should put it in a shady spot instead and so on. And there are 
some pretty serious ramifications to a bat colony that's using bat boxes if you start to make um, these types of decisions without really understanding uh, what it is that why the bats are there to begin with and what it is that you probably should be doing. Now, a uh, cool thing about bats, and of course, many of you will already know this, is that they have a very tight energy budget and make use of what's called torpor. So they're using uh, torpor, the ability to kind of lower their body temperature to take on kind of a cooler uh, body. And that's because flight is energetically expensive. So any chance that bats have to save energy, they need to do it. And it's again, all falling back to this really tight energy budget. Uh, of course, their food is not rich. They're not going to easily get fat. They have to consume large amounts of insects. And the season in which they're trying to reproduce is, especially in Canada, short. So they've got to do a lot of things in the summer, and especially uh, pups that have to uh, grow and get ready for hibernation as well. So these will make things extremely critical to uh, to getting the right roost in order to do all of this and make a living. And so how do they make a living? Well, it really boils down to picking the right types of roost, the right microclimate, and um, strategically using torpor. So just a quick review of torpor. Um, of course, bats are not snakes, but I do like to show this to kind of remind people that they are able to lower their body temperature to their surroundings. And that way they're using environmental um, temperature, environmental heat, for example, to, um, to either save energy, keep their body uh, warm, or let their body go cool. In either um, situation, the idea is that they are not burning their own fat to do so. Now, also what's very interesting is bats can be extremely strategic in that they can position their roosts in a way that they will passively rewarm. So if they want to be active for that night to go out and get insects, they might roost in a roost that will receive the late day sun. And that will actually warm the bats up, help them save energy. They don't have to use their own fat to warm their bodies up to active temperature and off they go. So they can be extremely strategic. And again, that requires um, picking the right roost to do so. Okay, so basically uh, bats can be heterothermic. They take on, they can take on the temperature of their surroundings to save energy. That usually means lowering their temperature. And what's most important to remember is a cold body is saving them energy because the cellular metabolism is slowed and they're not burning through their fat. Uh, their surrounding temperature then must be suitable. Right. And again, this could be a, a big review for a lot of you guys, uh, but I, I do feel it's fundamental to understand this because this is, of course, the root of um, roost selection to begin with. So just as a quick review then of, of torpor itself, um, they might use no torpor, okay, in which case, so for example, if a bat is not going to, to use any torpor, but they do need to uh, keep their bodies warm without burning a lot of energy, then they're going to have to select a roost that will keep their body warm. You know, 37 degrees Celsius is, is, of course, a typical mammalian temperature, which means they would have to find a really hot roost in order to keep their bodies at that temperature without themselves having to burn fat. Now, a lot of bats will um, use shallow torpor, where they'll save just a little energy by lowering their body temperature occasionally throughout the day. Uh, bats often refer to a shallow torpor, and then times of deep torpor, that might be needed, especially when there's not a lot of insects around anymore. They might try to cool their bodies way down, really slow that metabolic rate, and allow them to save a ton of energy. And that could be something like um, hibernation, for example. So an extended deep torpor in winter would be hibernation. And they can use this same principle, though, even during the summer, during really cold, rainy spells when there's lot, not a lot of insects and so on. But that requires finding the right roost. They would need to find actually a cold roost to be able to go into state of deep torpor. So for, torpor is, of course, very critical, especially when food sources are low. And whether they need a warm roost or a cold roost then will depend on their reproductive status, which I'll get into next, and the amount of food that's around. And of course, with, as with anything good, there are a lot of trade-offs. So just as a quick recap of why it is that torpor is um, not always possible and could be um, something that they can't do a lot. And that is some, for example, some uh, uh, sorry, reproductive females 
Okay, and then of course, um, just even simple things like digestion of food. So a cold body is not going to allow that digestion to happen well. More importantly for a reproductive female, that milk is not going to be produced, the fetus is not going to, to grow very quickly. For a male, they're not going to be able to produce sperm. They, um, they can't fly away in danger, so that's always um, an issue if there's predation risk. And then important for pups, if their bodies are cold, they're not growing either. So again, finding a roof that could allow them to be warm is really important, and yet they need to make sure that they don't spend a lot of their own energy in doing so. So how do you keep your body warm? Well, obviously, one option is, of course, to burn body fat. But the other way is to hang out in a warm roof, use the environmental heat. And that's, of course, where fat boxes come in. We're appealing to females that are having young that need to keep their bodies warm because they need to produce a fetus, they need to provide milk for that pup, they need that pup to grow. Then we are uh, looking at uh, roofs that um, are warm for those types of, of bats, those um, reproductive females will need a really warm roof. So the question then becomes, you know, where am I going to, to roost? Uh, am I using tulip or not? And of course, if the bat is reproductive, then she's going to want to find a hot roost. Now, I always feel obligated to say a little bit about males because they're completely different. Uh, of course, our focus with bat boxes is typically females because we are uh, generally trying to accommodate maternity roosts. But just very briefly, males come out in spring. They're looking for something fairly cold because what they like to do is just save tons of energy during the day. And so there may not be a lot of insects as well. They'll pick these cold roosts. Even in summer, they'll be picking cold roosts. They might even stay in hibernation for a long time. Uh, when they do finally get around to having to produce sperm, though, then they're going to look at ways to reduce um, their use of their own body fat to allow their bodies to be active enough to produce sperm. And some things, uh, for example, um, clustering into groups like bachelor colonies can happen to do that. And this actually does apply to non-reproductive females as well. But we largely look at reproductive females and they need a whole different strategy. So when they come out in spring, they're looking for something warm so they can jumpstart their gestation, right? They need to start developing that fetus. The faster they can have that, that um, pup, the longer it has to grow, the more likely it'll make through winter. They might also end up collecting some cold roosts during the spring to save energy, to go into deep torpor if there's not a lot of insect um, for them to eat. But when, uh, when they do have the option to find some of these warm roosts, they can take advantage of that and start developing the fetus. In summer, they're giving birth, they're nursing, so they need to have their bodies warm. They need to be able to um, raise this pup, and therefore they're going to have to seek roosts that are warm or hot, but not too hot. They really want roosts that are going to keep them in that you know, active body temperature range, 37, 40, up to 40 degrees Celsius or so, to be able to actually produce um, milk. Now, here's the other thing, is they're trying to raise a pup, and that pup needs to grow. Okay, so uh, we're going to look at pups in the next slide, so I'll come back to that. Uh, I will just point out then that towards the end of the summer, the needs change of these females. They actually, they still like to come back and see their pups, uh, but they're weaned, and so for the most part, they're going off into places that are much colder roofs so that they can save energy, uh, get fat, and prepare for hibernation. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the tricks of the trade for these bats are typically um, being very strategic and even getting into roofs that will uh, passively warm at strategic times of the day, for example, in the evening, so that uh, they don't have to burn their own fat to become active, or active temperature. Okay, so it's a little, it's obviously a little bit complicated. Uh, let's end with pups here as a review then of what it is they need. They need warm. They need warm, warm, and warm because they are going to have to grow and they are continuously doing this. They are learning to fly. They are they're learning to feed. They are um, hopefully gaining some weight, but they have till the very end of the season then to try to get to that full body size and gain some weight before they head off to hibernation. And I always um, like to point out then that 
because they are trying to grow at night when moms are out feeding, they're left alone. And having a roof that is warm, i.e. retains heat during the night, will allow them to grow faster. Now, that's not typically true of our bat boxes. Bat boxes, uh, especially in North America, being made of wood, they heat quickly, they cool quickly. Uh, there are other substrates that would allow that, that warmth to uh, be retained a little bit more in the summer uh, evenings. Now, I um, also feel obligated to point out that the you know, estimated half of the pups won't survive their first winter. And so, again, being able to get a jump start as quickly as possible and get um, that pup growing as soon in the season as possible will give them a better chance of surviving. So the take-home message, thermal properties of roots underpin reproductive success and survival. Thermal regulation is really everything, right? When we're talking roof selection, we are talking about microclimate. We are talking about what temperature ranges are available for those bats. And it is a little complicated because it's not simple throughout the season and it's not even, of course, the same between the sexes and so on. So um, it's not simple, but generally we are talking about females and we're talking bat boxes and we are talking about reproductive females. So that helps it narrow a little bit. And what time of year? Well, minimum spring and summer. And the microclimates then, basically in the spring, the daytime needs to be warm for gestation. They generally like some cool options as well during times when they want to use deep torpor to actually save energy. And during the summer, the daytime hot for lactation, summer, ideally nighttime is also hot for pup growth. So then the question becomes, is it even possible for a single bat box to meet the needs of a colony of bats for the entire reproductive season? Well, hopefully you'll realize that probably no. <laughs> and does a bat box then, uh, does it mimic these natural rock, rock crevices or natural crevices, sorry, that bats would roost in if they didn't have bat boxes? And, and the answer there is also no. So let's just review what it is that we're talking about when we talk about natural roost of maternity colonies. So here's a forest, for example. And this forest will have um, cracks and, and spaces under bark, lots of different microclimates. Those microclimates will change throughout the year or sort of throughout the season as well. The bats will switch roosts. We know this from studies being done um, here in Canada of roost switching and how uh, they will find the right microclimate needs for, uh, for that reproductive status um, that they're in. Now, a bat box then, we could think of it as a tree crevice. Um, in general, it's usually thinner wood and not necessarily um, as insulative as actually tree roosts would be, but nonetheless, we could think of it that way. But remember that a single tree isn't going to meet the needs of a bat colony in a summer, so it's really not um, right to expect that a bat box would as well. Same thing applies to rock roosting colonies. Now, this is actually some of the, uh, the work I did on thermal re regulation of bats uh, during my master's. And those um, natural crevices then in, in rocks actually do stay a little bit cooler, but you can be strategic. They, they can be very strategic and pick out some hotter roosts as well. And just like the trees then, they move around. And some roosts will reach over 50 degrees Celsius during the day, but those aren't the ones they're using in the midsummer anymore. Those are the ones they used at the beginning of the season when they needed that warmth um, in spring, for example, and then once they become too hot, they move to cooler ones. So I think we should just start talking about roosting areas. And if we start thinking about roosting areas for a colony and not focus so much on the roost and the bat box in particular, I think we might be able to figure out what it is that we should be doing to meet the needs of these um, colonies without potentially um, creating ecological traps. Now, of course, there is the all-inclusive roost, and it's probably <laughs> no wonder that a building, once it's inhabited by bats, it's basically there year after year and during the entire reproductive season because buildings, especially attic roosts in particular, can offer the whole range of microclimates. The females can move around, the pups can move around, they find what they need, and they don't have to be flying out from one roost to another. They don't have to carry the pups. There's that um, lowered predation risk and, uh, and lower risk of actually having to transport pups. So you can see why the bat, uh, buildings would be very um, popular. And in fact, this was one of the papers that came out of my master's degree was benefits of living in a building. Turns out that 
big brown box do better in a building than, than in rock crevices. Uh, they fledge, or sorry, they have birth early, they, the pups fledge earlier, more of the females are reproductive. They actually can use uh, torpor more to their advantage because they can find exactly the right temperatures and they don't have that predation risk, uh, presumably. So, so we do have obviously reasons, of, you know, obvious reasons why bats are in these buildings. And this sort of leads into a debate I often hear as well, is that, is, well, that's unnatural. Should we, you know, be trying to get bats to go back into natural rooms when we evict them from buildings because they shouldn't really be in those buildings to begin with? And I think to make that decision, you have to think about, um, is it a, are there appropriate natural roofs even left in the immediate area? Because, of course, now in these urban areas, generally the answer to that is no. And obviously just with our forestry practices, in some cases, you might look at trees and think, well, there's trees, but are they suitable trees? And evidence then does say that bats, you know, don't necessarily do as well in natural crevices. And yet at this point in time, because we are looking at recovering some of these building roosting bats, especially now in the east uh, with little browns, is this a really good time to be putting selective pressure on our bats to force them back into natural crevices, or would, should we actually just be mitigating now for loss of building roofs and putting up replacement roofs that are equivalent? So then the, the big question becomes, well, how do you properly replace a building roof after an eviction? So we circle back to this question I left you with earlier. How do we do this? So obviously understanding what the habitat was providing is important. You know, is it an attic roof or is it just, you know, up under a tin, some tin roofing? What type of microclimate options were available to those bats? Um, also, you know, how many bats? Now, this is an interesting question because I kind of feel like this one we might have gone a little astray. And that's because bat boxes tend to say how many bats they contain. Well, what that might lead to is decisions based on this. So people might watch, you know, do the count, decide there's about 600 bats coming out of their attic, they seal everything up, and they've ordered two bat boxes that each hold 300 bats, and they put them on, you know, the side of the house, or they put them out on a pole as recommended. And those 600 bats now all crawl and crowd into the, the existing bat boxes, and that's maybe where we run into some problems. And yet, bat condos, for example, are being seen as holding thousands of bats. And I have actually heard more than one person say to me, well, we're not even going to consider um, a condo or a mini condo because this roost is you know, less than 500 bats. We don't need something that holds thousands of bats. But it doesn't really boil down to capacity, and I think we might be doing a disservice by, by saying these bat boxes hold certain numbers of bats, because that's not the point, right? The point is the number of microclimates that it would offer to a colony, regardless of how many bats there are. So maybe we need to be careful about how people interpret capacity of these structures, and that that's not really the goal. Uh, it's good for planning, we do need to know that, but that's not, uh, that's not exactly the, um, the language we might want to use when we're trying to tell people how to replace their building roof. So it's not necessarily about the number, but the microclimate. Okay, continuing on, species. Now, I won't spend long on this, but in the West, we do have Yuma and Little Brown, and they often are in the same roof. So, for example, coming out of a building, there could be both Yuma and Little Brown, and the determination is, well, there's two species in there. Might even have big browns on there. But the Yuma and the, and the Little Brown in particular um, cause problems here in British Columbia because they look the same. People assume they might be the same species. And a single bat box, again, would, would not suffice because we know that in building roofs, from all the observations that have been published, these bats don't commingle. They keep separate in, in the building, maybe even on opposite ends of a, an attic, for example. So to expect them to commingle in a bat box might also not be appropriate. Of course, the sex, in most cases, we are dealing with females but uh, building roofs will actually accommodate males as well because of the huge microclimate ranges. Uh, and of course, I did mention the timing of occupancy and the microclimate. So ideally, what we would need to know then, uh, how to replace this lost habitat are all of these things. And additionally, ideally, 
um, something about the area. And this is sort of a theme I'd like to start putting out there a little bit, and that is look beyond your backyard. So we kind of have to, you know, say to landowners, yes, you might be evicting your bats. Um, now we need to understand the bigger picture here. Look beyond to see, well, are there other roofs available? Are your neighbors just going to inherit your bats, for example? Um, or are there no other clear roosting opportunities for these bats in the, the vicinity? Um, and of course, then I think it would be important to talk about very uh, proper mitigation strategies, if that were the case. Now, this again is all boiling down to bat life history strategies. They are, they are at high fidelity and they are long lived, and that does make them very susceptible to ecological sinks. Now, this is, this is a no-brainer for many of you, but I just really wanted to spell it out with some cute clip art pictures. We could have this urban bat colony, for example, starting off in 1965, spread out a couple of houses. We get some changes now, new houses being um, built, but obviously others becoming a little more decrepit. The bats are still making a living, finding what they need between these houses. Now we lose some of the natural rock habitat, uh, so we probably lost the opportunity for some of the males to be roosting out there, but the females are still making living in the buildings and maybe the males are in there now too. We suddenly have a redone roof, right? And now all the bats are in this one building. And the rezoning starts, which, you know, years later is not surprising in some of these communities. And now we've got Tim Hortons, we've got the Ramada, we've got a warehouse. And currently in 2019, we've got now this private home, which is... Uh, definitely getting very, very old, slated for demolition. Now, this is a kind of fictional scenario, but it's, it's also not. There's actually something very, very similar to this in one of our study areas in Creston, BC. And this building is about to disappear, and it's got a, a big colony, in this case, actually of Townsend's bats. But the question is, what is to be done? Is there any obligation to replace this habitat? And what would replace it? Okay, so looking beyond the backyard is especially important here. So, uh, for example, should they just replace this building with a single bat house? That has been done on many occasions. This, in fact, was done um, in another place near Creston, and that was our first overheating event this spring was there, where we don't think the bats had anything else to go to, so they stick it out in this bat box. If we were to look beyond the backyard, maybe we ask the neighbor if they can put some bat boxes in the, house, in, in the trees that are nearby. Or maybe this is actually a municipal park. Even better, maybe we can help them and convince them to come together and build a bat uh, condo or a mini condo. So those, these are the sorts of options that we would have to consider. Another case study, this um, one uh, in the Vancouver area, Again, a successful eviction from a regional park building. Now a large colony of bats goes up into these bat boxes, all facing the same direction, good solar exposure as recommended. And they have a lot of bats stuffed in there because it was a fairly big colony. Last year, this actually isn't this exact same box, but last year that's what they, just, they did see, bulging bats. And at one point then the death of about 70 some bats in about an hour and a half during a heat wave and they uh, I actually have a, a master student working in this area and the Burke Mountain Natural, Naturalists sorry, have been uh, very um, diligent about helping monitor this colony and it was discovered then that this roost had reached lethal temperatures and the heat stress index which we're now starting to measure in bat boxes combines temperature and humidity we don't know the humidity from these previous studies and most people usually only record temperature but in fact, heat stress is a combination of the two. So moving forward, knowing those uh, combinations is important. Luckily, Burke Mountain Naturalists, they were on it. They got a white sheet put up. They lowered the temperature by a few degrees, and that solved the problem. But why did this problem happen to begin with? One hypothesis is that the pups were large, but not yet volant. Maybe it was too far to carry them. This, these bat boxes are basically surrounded by a, a, a park and then city and the radio tracking that my master student has done has not located any really close roofs nearby. 
Uh, there was a, a brand new um, mini condo put in um, nearby that was not used. And then I'll get into some of that maybe later as to why we talk, we could talk about why BAPs don't inhabit some of these structures right away. But nonetheless, the, it does appear that there might have been an issue with these larger pups. Now, this isn't a little brown, this is actually Western small footed, but it gives you a sense of how big these pups can be before they actually start to fly. And you can imagine that mom trying to move that pup would be quite difficult. So when the stakes are high, these pups um, are stuck in the, in the roost and the moms may not try to leave with them. And if they were to leave them behind, they would probably be vulnerable to, um, to overheating. So how far apart should we place these roosts? You know, that's I think a question that really needs answered. And probably then considering the time of year when a, when a female might have to fly during the day, is that realistic for them to get from roost to roost? Okay, so let's talk about some of the, the solutions. Public awareness is probably one of our biggest ones at this point. They need to be aware that overheating is an issue and that they need to report these things because if we don't get the, the reports coming in, we're not going to be able to uh, start to tease out the, the situations that exist during these overheating events. Landowner cooperation. Now, believe it or not, some of these landowners go above and beyond duty to help these bats. So this one here, for example, in the, in the West Kootenai, that is an awning that is rolled out each day during the hot period and then rolled up again. So he recognized that that box needs to be warm for these bats to continue to raise their pups and, and not uh, compromise their gestation and, and their uh, lactation and so on. But just during the hottest part, they can't overheat. They, they need that awning. So he actually does it daily. Um, and I know that's not realistic for most landowners, but that is what this particular landowner is doing. I think it's also important that we don't overreact at this point. Uh, don't assume all bat boxes are bad because I think there's very clear evidence that they're not. We just have to start compiling these things enough to realize which ones are bad and which situations are, are perhaps detrimental. I think also not, in this, not overreacting, don't permanently modify these bat boxes because the maternity colonies are there for a reason. They're using them, they're finding warm environments. We don't want to delay their gestation. We don't want to cause pups to not grow as quickly if we just start to cool all these boxes. Well, then we could be affecting the long-term reproductive success of these, these colonies. But um, we also don't want to be removing them. You know, we, the, the bats are using them. We obviously need to make sure that those structures stay in place. But what can we do? Uh, I think at this point, we have no choice, at least in the interim, to add roosts. So we now just start providing additional roosting options to them. And so, for example, in this particular one, um, there could be a bank of, of um, bat houses or bat boxes put on the back side with a little crawlway between them. So bats actually don't even have to fly with their young. They can just move inside from one bat box over the other through a small um, crawlway into um, boxes that are a little more shaded on the back side. So that's one option. Um, in this case, for example, if this landowner decided he doesn't want to daily go out and put this awning down, he could build a bat box right next to the other one, again, with a little crawlway between them, and one will have a permanent awning and the other one wouldn't to allow them, again, to move between warm uh, or hot roosts that becomes too hot and then they can move over to the other one. There's also options of putting bat boxes in another location like the trees nearby, but then that would require flights. Okay, so just a few other... Um, interim solutions here. So try adding, find the resources to add more boxes in close proximity. So that, again, that maybe a crawl space between them. Think about the Goldilocks, right? The too hot, too cold, just right options, but that's going to change and you don't know which one is going to provide uh, what that, that needs or that maternity roost needs at that time in the season. So kind of um, mix it up. So remember that uniformity is not necessarily good. If all your bat boxes are facing the same way and you've got the multiple of bats, they're all getting the same microclimates and these could become ecological sinks. So yes, mix it up, style stains, mount the, mount the solar radiation, go with all the cardinal directions, shade sun. At this point, I think that's our best option until we actually know more. And also I would encourage us to start branching out with building materials. We know that these wooden bat boxes heat up too fast, they cool down too fast at night. 
ultimately there are other sub, uh, substrates or, or materials that we can use. They're more popular in Europe, doing things like uh, woodcrete, uh, or sorry, um, yeah, woodcrete, which is basically wooden cement, that sort of thing, and so on that would allow better uh, stable microclimate. Now, what are the long-term solutions? Well, the guidance that we provide, we do need to figure out what exactly we should be saying. Now, there's these interim solutions that I'm proposing, but of course, we need to know a lot more to be able to be uh, a little more strategic and prescriptive. So we need to answer these tough questions and soon. So there needs to be more experimentation, different construction materials, for example. Um, and we need to compile everything we know about so far including the gray literature and then we need to understand how well our bats are doing like reproductive rates for example under what circumstances and when do we get heat stress and when do we get mortality and so on now there is a, a research project that um, that WCS Canada is um, undergoing right now with a um, master's student which I will talk about in a few minutes but in the meantime let's just return to this question for a second so during um, these times of greatest vulnerability with these large pups, I do want to ask you one more question, and that is, when we talk about placing these bat boxes then, do we just leave this up to chance, or can we be strategic, or should we be strategic about, bo about bat, bat box placements? Now, if it's left to chance, what happens? Which, here's just an example. Um, if you randomly handed saplings to people on the street, and ask them to go plant them, what are the chances you would get an intact forest? They're well, probably pretty low. And so, you know, we have these bat building workshops and, and people like to just go out and, and build them and buy them. And it's sort of a random process. And do we just hope that a roosting area emerges that's suitable for a colony of bats? Again, probably not the strategy we should be taking moving forward. So do we need these city planners that hold look beyond the backyard, talk to the neighbors, you know, this, this is not easy. No one said it would be easy, but I, I think we need to at least start thinking a little bit differently about this and talking about communities. And, and I know that community bot programs are starting to talk strategically about bat-friendly communities, and this is our opportunity now to see these things as more of community efforts, not just the person with the bat problem in their attic. So one could go big or go numerous and diverse. And you can see, for example, you know, back to back, back boxes, different stains, maybe a crawlway between them. One will get sun, one will not. Uh, different options under shades of trees, uh, different chambers, different styles. You know, until we know more, I think the, the goal really here is just to, you know, do different things and let the bats choose. Okay, so finally, our village, village planning then. Um, your roost is just one piece of the roosting area puzzle is probably the message we should probably uh, get out there now. And if it's the only piece, then, then that roost is critical and proper mitigation is going to be required. And, and of course, now we've got to talk about what is that proper mitigation. It might take a village to raise the next generation of bats. And our bat boxes, or sorry, our bat uh, buildings, the buildings that bats are currently in, those are disappearing. And we do know we hear more about you know, people doing renovations to exclude them. So to ensure that we do have suitable roofs for tomorrow, we probably have to start thinking a little bit differently than we have been so far. And who are going to be those village planners? Who's, you know, who's going to be able to kind of direct people um, and, and look at these artificial structures and help make decisions. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of ways that could be done, but and no, no pressure, but simply to acknowledge the great work that the community bat programs are doing, especially here in the West, where we've got the Alberta Community Bat Program and the BC Community Bat Program. They're on the ground, they're talking to people, they're making guidance, they're keeping up, um, you know, with, with the guidance. And it's probably moving forward, these community uh, focused types of, of guidance documents that are probably going to be more and more important and talking to municipalities rather than just to individual landowners. Okay, and finally, uh, I did mention that we do have a research project that started up this summer. Uh, Susan Dulk is doing work in British Columbia. Uh, Corey Olson is, is overseeing some work in Alberta. And ultimately, the goal is to gather um, temperature and humidity profiles of bat roofs and do that in relation to their occupancy and then look at reproductive success and try to understand in what scenarios bats do well or bat boxes 
doing well in some areas? What in what areas? And how does that compare to something like building roofs, where we know they have generally more microclimate options? All of that information is going to underpin a new best management practices document that uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is currently funding, and they would like to see a joint document then between U.S. and Canada that allows us to better um, provide oversight guidance direction on, on the use of these bat boxes as mitigation tools. So we are reaching out to individuals with data, hoping to get anything and everything gray, published, everything compiled, compiled together and hopefully get a better understanding of what is working and what we know and don't know and then use that to develop the guidance. So if you are interested um, in joining this committee, we definitely uh, would welcome your um, participation. Our next meeting won't be till fall. We've really just got started, and so you can email either Yordi or um, my master's student, Susan Dolt. And we do have um, you know, a fair, fair number of people who have joined from different agencies, but you know, having everybody's perspective there and, and more data, the better. Please send any uh, literature you have, gray or or published. Now just to end here, a few little morsels, I guess, um, going along on the food for thought. Construction materials. I have mentioned this um, in passing already, but we do need to start thinking about what we build our bat boxes out of, I think, and, and looking at why it is, for example, that they don't occupy brand new wood um, usually. And under what situations do they not? It doesn't have to be well weathered. What does that mean? Why? Is old wood better? I do know that there's been um, you know, some talk about building these bat boxes out of old wood. Maybe it's the old building that's being demolished, for example. And it would be nice to start seeing some results of, of did that allow faster occupancy? Also, is it, you know, is, it, is it a type of wood? Could there be a difference between North America and Europe, for example, because we typically use plywood, which is blue wood fiber, versus untreated sawn wood, which is used um, for bat boxes typically in Europe. And for all we know, the bats are smarter about gassing off or something, or maybe it's just thinner and not as, as great at retaining heat. These are some of the questions I think we should ask. Um, also, you know, a mixture of concrete and wood that's been used by some uh, bat boxes, especially in Europe. And those have different structural properties, but they're also better for maintenance. You don't have to do as much to maintain those. And is that something we should be thinking about as well, again, to prevent our bat boxes aging over time and becoming ecological sinks with these long-lived species. Okay, um, and I did mention this already, different materials then. Let's, let's look at stable temperatures, perhaps mixing it up more. Okay, uh, one little uh, tidbit I, I usually like to throw in here is this, is this use of the word bat. Have we kind of done a disservice? And maybe, maybe we need to think a, a little bit more about this. We don't refer to hoofed mammals. We actually say caribou and moose. And of course, people know caribou and moose have different habitat needs. But bats are just bats, according to the public. And, and, and they wouldn't know any better because we call them bat houses and we talk about bats. But of course, there's many species and they have different roosting requirements. And so is the, is the public kind of ready to start hearing something a little more specific um, about like little brown and, and yuma and big brown and so on? And maybe in doing so, we'll communicate that message a little bit better that not not a bat box doesn't meet the needs of all um, bats. And, and this brings me into the topic of enhancement because I do hear this occasionally where, more and more actually, where you know properties are purchased by people who really want to do good things for bats. And so they want to enhance. And they want to go put up some bat boxes. They want to put up maybe even a condo because you know if you put up a bat box, you do good things for bats. And do we know enough to be able to do this? Because suddenly, we're putting up structures in areas that have never had a big maternity roost of building roosting bats. And, and what are we doing to the other species of bats in that area? So these are you know, things I think we start to have to start to pay attention to a little bit more. Okay, I'm just uh, wrapping up kind of on the same food theme, I guess. Uh, hopefully I've given you food for thought and you know, a little bit of a, a take out. Um, the meat of what I hope I have been communicating is really the importance of bat thermal needs. It, it's complicated, but it underpins everything when it comes to roost and roost selection and reproductive success. 
and the roosting requirements do vary throughout the season. And I think we have to, at this point, just not assume that all bat boxes are bad. Uh, certainly mitigation decisions about placement, numbers of boxes, the characteristics of the boxes, those, those might be bad, and that's what we have to get a better handle on. Uh, and, and we quickly need to determine then what causes an ecological trap. But if we apply what we know about building roosts and natural roosting areas already, we can make the assumption that bats need a lot of different microclimates. They need to be able to find um, the appropriate temperatures, not too hot, not too cold, just what they need, just right at that point in time to raise their, their pup. So the fixings, let's consider the changing needs of the colony throughout the season. One bat box will not meet all those needs. And if, if, that is, if bats are forced to into one box for a good chunk of the summer, that's maybe when we run into problems with an ecological trap. So think roosting area, look beyond the backyard. Um, the microclimate availability, it's, it's really everything. Volume or capacity of a bat box is, is good for planning, but not the main point. Distances between the roofs, think of them from the perspective of a bat in distress. Maybe even try to put the boxes adjoining, one with different cooler micro op, uh, microclimates than the other one, for example, so that a bat could move out of um, an overheating bat box. And then, of course, think about the language that we use. And I have mentioned um, all of these things already a little bit, bat box versus bat house and bat versus saying specifically little brown or even building roosting species and so on. Okay, now that's all I really wanted to say. I, I have one last slide actually here just um, on a little tangential, and that is bat boxes, are they more than just roost? Because some of you might have heard that the um, WCS Canada in collaboration with Thompson Rivers University and McMaster and now UBC Okanagan, we, um, we are looking at um, applying a probiotic that we have developed to prevent, not treat, white nose syndrome, and we'll be applying it at bats at summer roost. Our goal is to introduce no chemicals and no foreign microbes. So what we did was we swabbed Western bats and got uh, all the microbes off their wings and we uh, challenged those with PD and found a good combination. We're using four bacteria that are naturally found in soil and they came off of big brown longyard and Townsend figured bats. And we have been doing captive trials in Kamloops to um, just verify that everything is, is good when these are applied to bats, they remain healthy, and that this is um, a good cocktail then for helping to um, prevent white nose syndrome from taking hold and, and PD specifically then from taking hold on the wings. So the, uh, the goal will be to apply this actually this summer in Metro Vancouver at bat boxes. And we're gonna use a pro, uh, probiotic infused clay dust that goes up in the box, just like a natural rock crevice. The bats will crawl in, they get a little dust on them, in and out, in and out, in and out for the last part of the summer. And they will gradually build up an, um, these uh, new microbes or probiotic microbes on their wings as just part of a natural floor. They might already have some, just simply um, boosting it if they already do have some. And then they go off to winter hibernation and hopefully uh, PD then has a hard time uh, taking hold in the wings. Now we won't know a lot of, uh, about the success. We won't know if it's self-inoculating, self-propagating. We know that this has to continue on a regular basis. All of that is yet to come and we won't know that for well, at least till next spring and then possibly even a year or two until White Nose actually um, gets into the, the Metro Vancouver area where we're doing this experiment. So. So that was just a little uh, tangential, but uh, do stay tuned then for more details as that moves forward. So I'll just end by acknowledging uh, WCF Canada's BAT program funders and collaborators, and thank you all for your support and for um, attending the presentation today. I don't know if we have a lot of time for questions, but I'm willing to stay late if anybody does want to have a, a discussion and some questions. Thank you very much for that, Corey. That was very, very insightful. You uh, posed a lot of good questions and answered those questions, and uh, you answered a lot of questions that I had myself, and I'm sure that others had. Uh, very good to, to hear some of the guidance for, for kind of what, what do we do now, uh, as well as looking at the future and, and knowing that, uh, uh, that the groups are working on, on long-term solutions and long-term answers uh, regarding bat boxes and making sure that bats are safe using them. So thank you very much. And uh, yes, as Corey mentioned, uh, there's there's some time left uh, for questions. 
Uh, I think participants should be able to unmute themselves uh, to ask questions. So feel free to do that if you have a question. Otherwise, uh, you can also type it into the chat box uh, of the WebEx service. Uh, and then I can read them out uh, and hopefully have Corey answer them. So any questions? And I might have to unmute people, so I'll just I'll just experiment with it. I'll click unmute all, uh, and that should allow people to uh, ask questions. So if you're not speaking, uh, try to mute yourself manually now. If you do have a question, uh, now's the time to ask. You know what, um, I obviously don't have all of the, the answers. I'm really posing a lot of questions here, um, assuming that, you know, we're going to we're gonna have some good discussion and hopefully stimulate um, some, some group filing of, of data that may be sitting on people's computers and um, hopefully maybe even stimulate some experiments and, and coming together to try to understand this a bit better. And so, yeah, I mean, we, we could have discussions one-on-one, -on -one too, if you want. To discuss something at some point, um, please feel free to get a hold of me or Susan. I'm not hearing any questions from anyone, so uh, what Corey suggested is, is, is uh, I think the best approach. And I'm sure, as people are recording of this, uh, they'll have questions as well. Uh, and I'm sure we're going to have lots more discussion. I'm quickly looking at the chat box. Um, Ooh, okay, yeah, I don't see the chat. Some questions mm -hmm. there. I, I will mute everyone again because there is quite a lot of them. Um, let's see. So there is a question. Um, has anyone evaluated natural roots to see if overheating is a potential concern? I.e., would you see similar response in a bed box and natural roots in the same location? Okay, so. Um, I can answer this mostly uh, from from my experience, um, but it's also out in the in the literature as well, where people have measured temperatures of natural roofs. And for example, in the rock crevices I was um, talking about, I followed a big brown colony there, and several of their really popular spring roofs, springtime roofs, which is a boulder slab where they would be tucked up under there. Uh, by midsummer, those were plus 50 degrees Celsius. Of course, those bats were nowhere near them. They had moved on to much deeper rock crevice roofs by then um, to, to get cooler, uh, still warm. You know, those, those deep crevices were too cold in the spring to allow gestation, but now they were just right in the heat of the summer. But they were all in very close proximity. You know, each, each of these roofs was sometimes only a meter, couple meters away from each other, maybe, you know, 25 meters for some of them. And they're, they're in small areas, and it depends on the species, obviously, as to how far the, the roofs are spread. But but certainly in a natural situation, a, a roosting area allows these bats to, to avoid the, those overheating, it seems. Those bats would move to a nearby more suitable roost. Thank you. Um, and I'm seeing another question in the chat box. Uh, what time of year did you notice the overheating events? Uh, from older research, several myota species were able to deal with warm temperatures later in the season. Okay, so um, so the first part of that, yeah, basically the overheating events, um, so Susan Dalk actually uh, saw the first one. Landowners contacted her actually a few weeks ago uh, here in, in the uh, the West Kootenai of British Columbia, and that's because we had an unusually warm uh, spring. It actually we've had some very hot days already. We've had over 30 degrees Celsius in a number of areas in BC already. Um, so she saw those, but typically we would be finding them more in the middle of the summer, um, uh, July and August. But out of interest sake too, what she did notice because she was one of her study sites, she had temperatures in the box that were reaching over 40 degrees, but 100% humidity where there was uh, outside, you know, it was um, plus 28 is all, but this box was in the direct sunlight. And um, 
And so there was high humidity with all the bats in there probably, creating their own evaporative um, environment or, or humidity in, in that environment. And then these bats had nowhere else to go to, so they were flying out during the day and fleeing to nearby trees to, just to get into shade. It doesn't necessarily, you know, um, reflect what they would do if they had pups. This time of year, they don't have pups, so they're fleeing during the day, and the, and the landowner's notified her of that. So that's just, you know, I think it's not clear what time of year this is a problem, but um, but definitely with, with heat waves, it seems to be we're noticing uh, these heat events. Thank you for that answer. Uh, I'm not seeing anything more in the chat box. Uh, I don't hear anyone speaking up. Um, we are at the top of the hour, so it would be a good time to uh, to wrap up. Um, so thanks again, Corey. That was very, very informative. Uh, and everyone uh, knows that, uh, that this is not the end of the story. Uh, a working group is working on this, and, uh, and more answers will follow. Um, so I'm sure that uh, after a while, uh, it might be time to do another updated uh, uh, webinar uh, with updated information, hopefully. So thanks again, uh, Corey, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, have a nice rest of your day. Great. Thanks, Jordi, for hosting, and thanks everyone for attending. Okay. Bye. Bye.